idea behind protein crystallization is similar to the uh, concept of making rock candy. And when you use the protein crystals um, in extra crystallography to figure out the structure of the protein at the atomic level, so what the protein like looks like, well, that's even way more sweet. But actually getting a protein to crystallize, well, don't expect a treat. Instead, expect lots of screening and optimization. So basically, um, we can get proteins to crystallize, then we shoot x-rays at them, and those x-rays scatter, and we're practicing the scattering, and we get the structure. And I talked about that really fast, because I just did a couple of posts on that, um, that you can look back on if you're interested in that. But today, I want to talk more about how we actually get these crystals to form. Quick note, as usual, I found that I had a lot more to say than could fit into 10 minutes. So I'm going to tell you about the theory today and then tomorrow I'll plan to show you what it actually looks like in person um, because I know that that's probably what some of you are more interested in. Love you grandma! Crystallography is a fine balance between getting proteins to form protein-protein interactions that they need to form crystals um, and between protein water interactions which they need to like not clump up and stuff and so when you have a protein in solution it's surrounded by a coat of water molecules so there's not the protein protein contacts um as you remove water then you have more protein protein contacts formed um but you want these to form in an orderly way to get a crystal and not just um a disorderly way where you get that you can think of crystallography as kind of being this game where we have this field plan that we can represent with a crystallization diagram. And so on the y-axis we have the free protein concentration. So this is the protein that's still in solution and it hasn't come out to crystallize. And on the x-axis we have the precipitant concentration. So this is the concentration of like your salt, um, your pig, your organic solvent, that sort of thing. And so the idea is that there are different zones in this field um, and they're separated by these equilibrium lines. So equilibrium is where you have the same amount um, in both of the surrounding zones and they're like going back and forth but at the same rate. So there's no change in like the ratios of the two. And so you start at this um, place one where you have a fully dissolved protein and then you want to increase the protein into a super saturated zone. Um, so you're passing through this thing called the metastable zone. Um, so in the metastable zone, you have crystals can grow, but they can't form. And so crystal formation in, in, um, requires this thing called nucleation, where basically if you trend setting proteins um, come out of solution into is a crystal and then um, you can have crystal growth where other protein molecules join in to make the crystal grow. Um, and so when you're growing the crystal, you're actually taking proteins out of the solution. So when you go, so you start at the one and then you, um, get this protein more concentrated. And so you can do this by actually like physically removing water, such as with diffusion methods, um, or with removing what, like the activity of the water. So making it seem like there's less water, such as by adding salts that are going to steal the water, um, or that sort of thing. And so by doing this, you're pushing the protein into that nucleation zone where you can have those trend setting molecules start the crystal going. As this crystal starts growing, then it's going to be taking um, more protein out of the solution. So now you're going down on the Y axis um, so you're lowering the free protein concentration. And now you're going back into that metastable zone that you passed through before. Um, so in this metastable zone, you don't get more nucleation, which is good because now you're not getting a bunch of tiny little crystals growing. Um, and you can focus on growing the crystals that you do have. Um, and then eventually the crystals will grow and then you'll take out so much protein as the crystals are growing that you're going to go back into the um, undersaturated zone where there's not... And, I mean, there's plenty of solvent for all the free protein, and so you're not going to get more crystals um, growing or that sort of thing. And so it looks all nice and orderly here, but the thing is that we can't predict, like, where these lines, the field lines are going to be, um, how the protein's going to respond. So, like, the rate at which it's moving through those different zones is going to depend on things like the temperature. Um, and that's also going to affect, like, where the lines are. 
um, and different proteins have different field diagrams and it's all just very empirical so a lot of trial and error and so because there's so much trial and error we have to turn to um, large screening methods um, followed up by optimization when everything goes right you get nice crystals but if you undershoot so you don't you um, don't have like enough precipitants or that sort of thing, then your protein's gonna stay in the undersaturated zone um, and so you're not going to get crystals and your drops will remain clear. If you slightly overshoot it, um, then you're going to, like you go too high um, with your um, initial nucleation conditions, then you're going to get lots of defective small crystals and you're going to have so much nucleation because they're going so far um, through that nucleation zone that they're not going to spend much time in the metastable zone, so they're not going to be able to grow um, and you're quickly going to reach back into the undersaturated zone, so you basically spend all your protein resources making little small crystals, um, which aren't very useful. Um, and then at the other um, extreme from the undershooting, we have the really overshooting where um, basically you just go straight, you bypass all of, like the nucleation zone, the metastable zone, nucleation zone, you go straight into this um, oversaturated zone where only precipitate can form. So the protein just clumps up and you get this nice, this gross little clumpy aggregate. Um, so these are the kind of drops that you'll see um, so you want the drops with the crystals. Sometimes it can actually be hard to see if there actually are crystals, and so you want um, to monitor them like over days and see if what you think might be a crystal is actually growing, and that's a good sign that it's a crystal, um, and hopefully it's a protein crystal and not like a salt crystal. Um, but as I said before, this is all really empirical, and so it's a lot of trial and error, um, and trying to get the drops that actually are helpful. One of the most common ways that we do um, crystallography is with the technique called vapor diffusion. So here I'm showing you hanging drop crystallization, but you can also do sitting drop crystallization in which the protein is, instead of being on like the roof, it's on a little like ledge. The idea here is that you have a drop containing um, a solution of the precipitants um, and that sort of thing, so your crystallization cocktail, um, and you mix that with the uh, drop of your protein solution and so now this is making a more dilute solution of the colors like the precipitants and stuff and then you have that like hanging above or sitting above this reservoir containing just the crystallization um cocktail so just the like the precipitants and stuff and so that solution in the reservoir is going to be more concentrated than the solution in the drop in terms of like your precipitants. And so it's just an oversimplification, but basically the water is going to come out of the drop to kind of like dilute, try to dilute that reservoir. So because there's more, like the water concentration is higher in the drop than in the reservoir, so the water is going to leave the drop. Um, and as you're doing this, you're concentrating the solution more and in the slow controlled way. And so you're actually, you're like concentrating it because you're removing the water and you're also concentrating it um, like effectively because you are increasing the precipitant concentration and that is going to be like because the precipitant takes water effectively takes water away from the protein so you're like double dehydrating the protein um in this controlled fashion that hopefully supports crystal growth how fast that diffusion out of the water out of the drop occurs is going to depend on a number of factors and one of these factors is actually the drop volume um, as well as the cocktail to protein solution ratio in that drop. So if you have like one microliter of cocktail versus two microliters of your protein solution, um, as opposed to two microliters of cocktail versus one microliter of your protein solution. Um, and so that can really influence how fast the diffusion occurs. Um, so can the temperature. And so also just like the overall size of the drop um, and even how you pipette the drop. So whether it like spreads out more versus like stays balled up. And so that can depend in part on the like stickiness of the molecules in it um, and how much like surface tension it has. And so you have this idea of like surface area to volume ratio. So if your drop is more spread out, then there's going to be more surface area compared to volume and you're going to get faster diffusion out um, versus if you have like a more round droppy drop, um, it's going to have a higher 
a lower surface area to volume ratio and so it's going to take slower to diffuse out so you one of the things you test is often like the ratios in these different drops and the drop sizes and so often what i actually do is do like two drops per well um so you have two drops where you have different concentrations or you have different amounts of the various things in the drops um both over the same well because there are so many things to try and so like i was when i was talking in microliters before that's because we can really only manually pipette reliably in the microliter range, um, but that can take a ton of protein. And so when we use the crystallization robots, they're actually working at like 10 times less um, or even lower. So you're working in like the nano, um, nanoliter range. So instead of millionth of a liter, like you have with a microliter, you have a billionth of a liter, so a nanoliter. Um, and this can use a lot less protein, um, but it, you can't like manually pipette that, so the, but the robots are able to do this, like the mosquito robot. pH is really important for protein crystallography. So pH is like how acidic or basic a solution is. So the more acidic, um, the more protons um, available for the protein to bind onto, and so protons are positively charged. Um, there are certain protein letters, so amino acids, that can take um, on those protons and become positively charged at high pH. Um, so this can add positive charge or neutralize negative charges. And at the opposite end, so if you have um, a, if you have a higher pH, so you have a more basic or alkaline solution, um, you're going to lose protons from the protein. Um, so you're going to have like a negative, your protein will get more negatively charged um, and it'll lose positive charges. And so the charges on the proteins are one of the ways that proteins interact with one another. Um, and so if you have different pH that's going to influence how the protein interacts with other protein molecules um, versus the protein water molecules. And so at this point called the isoelectric point is the point at which the protein is neutral overall. So you might have positive and negative charges um, like scattered throughout the protein, but overall it's going to be neutral. This is typically the point where you have lowest solubility of the protein um, because the protein needs some of those charges in order to interact with water because water is highly polar, so it has positive and negative regions. Um, and so those regions like to hang out with positive and negative regions of the protein. And so if you don't have as many of those regions because you're at the PI, then you're gonna have less um, solubility. So the basic idea is just here that with P the PI, is going to the p each protein is a different pi um, based on its amino acid composition and where you stand in um position to the pi is going to influence the protein solubility and how well it's going to crystallize but it's hard to predict even if you know the pi of the protein um where it's likely to crystallize because the pH changes are going to affect not just the protein-protein interactions, but also the protein-water interactions, and they can do this in kind of like unpredictable ways. Um, so really, it is just a lot of trial and error, and this is why pH is one of the things they use. Some of the most popular precipitants are synthetic polymers, like um, PEGs, polyethylene glycols. So a polymer is just like a chain of repeating units, um, and so this is just a, a certain kind of polymer, and it has these they're long floppy um, chains of these like ethylene oxide units, which don't worry too much about that, other than that it has those oxygens, um, which is gonna make it, help make it polar and make it water soluble, um, but it's long and floppy and it's kind of like one of those airmen that's outside of the car dealerships like flopping around. Um, it flops around a lot and this creates this large excluded volume where other molecules can't be. So it's taking up more space than it deserves. It's like man spreading at the molecular level. Um, and because it's stealing so much space, this is leaving less space available for the proteins and so the proteins might team up um, and help crystallize. Salt is just another word for like a neutral combo where you have a cation, so a positively charged molecule and an anion, a negatively charged molecule. If you put a salt in water and it's sol water soluble, then the salt is going to dissociate. So the cation and the anion are going to come apart. So you're adding a bunch of positive and negative charges to this liquid. Um, 
and water has positive and negative charges, um, like partial charges, because of the whole like polarity thing where the oxygen's hogging the electrons. And so this makes water really want to hang out around the salts. And so the, the salts are going to steal a lot of the water. And this is basically, you're not changing how much water there actually is in the solution, but it's like you're taking away water from the protein because you're using it all for the salt. And so when you're doing crystallization, if you have a high salt concentration, that can act as a precipitant to help take water away from the protein and get the protein to crystallize. And you can increase the salt concentration gradually if you're doing like diffusion, um, so vapor diffusion or something where you're actually physically taking away water um, and increasing the salt concentration that way.